All right, let's talk about oil just for a sec, and then uh, we'll get into questions for the midterm, okay? Um, yeah. All right, I won't talk too much about the TF, the true false quiz anymore because people are still taking that. All right, so uh, we talked about all the good things about oil. It's very energetically dense, it's easy to transport, there's infrastructure all over the world that makes it uh, very conducive for global trade. Um, it's the energy carrier uh, writ large for the entire 20th century and still going strong this century as well. But there are obvious downsides, uh, the greatest of which is climate change. We'll talk about that next week, uh, so I won't belabor that point. But there are some other environmental and social, ju social justice consequences associated with it. And if any of you want to explore these topics uh, in detail for your podcast, you're welcome to. But again, more on the podcast later. So anybody recognize this image? Deepwater Horizon. Yeah, so this was the big BP spill uh, in 2010. Um, so this was a production rig. So it wasn't actually pulling oil out of the out of the seafloor. It was drilling into the seafloor. And so first, first the seismologists scout where the oil is, and then they send out one of these production uh, drilling rigs or a drilling rig and they drill, um, they send a series of pipes deep down to the seafloor and then they drill several uh, more, yeah, just a little bit more oil lecture. Uh, and then they drill several more kilometers below the seafloor. Um, not, I, I sometimes do a whole lecture on this because it's a fascinating topic. Um, and then the whole process of exploration and drilling and stuff. But the short of what went wrong here was they, uh, maybe I'll just draw right on this. Um, annotate, draw. The short of it, once they got below, here's the sea floor. Here's the, per, here's the, what's called the blowout preventer. It keeps it from causing a blowout. And then this goes several kilometers up to wherever the drilling platform is. Can't draw any tall, taller than that. Um, so then they, they drill deep below the sea to wherever the oil reservoir is. And within this drilling here is, this is just rock layers on either side. And this is just jagged raw rock in this borehole along the side. And they put piping and it telescopes ever smaller as they place more and more pipe until they get to the reservoir. And they put this piping all the way down and in each, each section of pipe, they then inject mud through the pipe. Mud is just a slurry of like sand and adhesives and detergents. Um, they inject mud and that circles back up on either side to create this like impermeable bear, layer between the uh, the raw rock and the pipe and that's supposed to be impermeable so no fluids can go through there no water no oil no gas no air bubbles no nothing and they that's supposed to be sealed all the way down with mud um, to make sure that these pipes are in the center of this borehole they place these spacers these little metal springs as as they uh, put the pipe down and that centers the pipe um, this was a combination of work by Halliburton, uh, BP, um, I forget some of the other players, but it was, it was way over time and way over budget. The last thing you wanna happen in any engineering project. And so they started cheaping out on things like they were missing safety checks, they were missing quality control consults. And then they, um, they, they ran out of spacers at one point. And so they started spacing the spacers uh, much further apart. And what this led to was, again, if this is, this is uh, the, the raw borehole, it led to basically a, a super janky pipe job. And it was no longer, then when the mud circled back, it was no longer impermeable. One of the first things they should have known that was going wrong is this taking much more mud than they thought it should. Uh, so the volume of mud was, was much greater which should have been a clear indication that it must have been like piling up on the seafloor on either sides, like squirting out the top. 
Um, another bad indication is they had uh, um, negative pressure on their pressure sensor, which means like they couldn't maintain pressure, which means they probably didn't have a seal. Um, and then finally, the, the big indicator that something was wrong was, yeah, all the pressure sensors went crazy one day um, and uh, they thought that they lost the well. Um, they weren't detecting um, a leak at the base yet, but then what happened at the, at the platform itself is the last thing they noticed before it exploded was all the lights got super bright and all the computer monitors started sparking and breaking. And so what was happening is they had a, on the rig itself, they had a, a Brayton turbine, a natural gas turbine that powered it. And, um, you know, air goes in here and then natural gas combusts here. And then uh, exhaust comes out here. It's just the standard turbine that powers like Bellingham downtown. But what was happening was all this methane was bubbling to the surface from this leak at the pipe and it was going into the air intake so that turbine was running super rich it was running off of oxygen methane and methane so it spun up really fast um, uh, the power went really high on the rig made all the lights bright because that energy has to go somewhere it's first law of thermodynamics popped all the computer monitors um, caused sparks, those sparks ignited the ambient methane all around the rig and the thing exploded. And then they lost control of this pipe. This blowout preventer fell over sideways, cracked the pipe, and then there's a massive gusher because now we had a rock or total open conduit to the, uh, to the reservoir down below. And so yeah, it was massive, massive oil spill. And this sort of thing happens when we're doing very complex engineering operations, right? There's, uh, especially when things are time sensitive, money sensitive, and uh, there's things that can go wrong, right? These are nonlinear um, chaotic systems and you can't predict everything. And they take a team of 200 people. So not a single individual has any idea of the whole picture. Nobody knows exactly what's going on in all different uh, aspects of it. And so, yeah, mistakes can cascade. Um, yeah, they poured a bunch of detergent on it. It's called a dispersant that breaks up the hydrocarbons and allows it to decompose more quickly. But of course, that's that's toxic. Um, it also the the longer hydrocarbons, the tars, just get gummed up and then sink to the bottom of the seafloor. Um, yeah, there's a lot of environmental harm that happened that collapsed the tourist and seafood market down in the Gulf for uh, several years. Um, but. I won't spend any more time on that. If you take energy 380, energy in the environment, we talk a lot more about that. Clear all drawings. Okay. Um, this is Kern River De Delta outside of Bakersfield, my favorite town in the world. Um, this is actually like right next to a bunch of wineries. Don't buy wine from Bakersfield. It usually is called like Central Coast, you know, some nondescript name. So you don't know what you're actually drinking. So here's some details on deep rise and oil spill. Largest marine oil spill in the history of the petroleum industry. So here's New Orleans here, the uh, Louisiana Delta, Mississippi Delta in Louisiana, I should say. Um, and this is the massive oil spill just, so it's gushing here and just circulating with various ocean currents. Um, 4.9 billion, 4 .9 million uh, barrels of oil from April 20th to July 15th. Um, Here's some other uh, large oil spills in context. So this was 5 million. Um, the first major oil spill was the Lakeview Gusher in California. This is Kern River Delta down by Bakersfield in 1910. Uh, ran for 18 months, 9 million uh, barrels of oil. And this was a true, true gusher. Um, back in the early days of oil prospecting, you could like trip over a rock and discover a tremendous amount of oil. Uh, this was kind of the motivation, one of the motivations for that movie, There Will Be Blood, which is an exceptional film about uh, oil and uh, laissez-faire capitalism, I should say. Um, really, really cool movie. I do want to make like a class that just does like energy movies like Syriana, There Will Be Blood, um, among others. Uh, 
Yeah. So this had an EROI, an energy return on energy invested of like hundreds of thousands, meaning for every like amount of energy they put in, they got several, several uh, um, uh, energy, several, several hundred thousand X energy back. Uh, present day oil is like 90 to one in Saudi Arabia and like only five to one in the tar sands. Not, not the best energy return there. Another massive one was the um, Ixtoc, uh, one in Gulf of Mexico, 1979. This was uh, the in the Mexican um, oil production down by like Cancun. Um, Exxon Valdez up in Alaska. Um, this wasn't a massive spill. I mean, it's still a massive spill. Like we're talking 0.75 million barrels of oil, but not compared to these other ones. But it was in an incredibly sensitive um, ecosystem. And so, yeah, bad stuff there. Um, Gulf War One in Kuwait, 1991, um, five million barrels spilled. Uh, and this was uh, as the U.S. troops were advancing towards Baghdad. Um, Saddam Hussein had his troops uh, destroy all the oil wells, so that, um, in his view, and perhaps rightly so, we wouldn't steal the oil. But it's it's pretty environmentally horrible. That smoke spread around the entire globe. Mainly uh, uh, was dissipated over India and China. Um, another movie about this would be Jarhead. Uh, the troops are marching um, uh, while the oil is on fire and it's actually like the smoke is interacting with the weather system and it starts raining like soot and, and oil uh, while they're there, which did happen in reality. It's not just a fiction. Um, and then here's the Macondo. This is the BP uh, oil spill that happened in 2010. So these things, these happen, you know, on, on a decadal basis and um, it's part and parcel with uh, pulling vast quantities of overpressurized hydrocarbons out of the, out of the crust of the earth. Um, social justice aspect of oil. There's numerous, several in this country, but I think one of the, the most glaring examples is the Niger Delta in uh, Nigeria. Um, any given day, if you just type in uh, Niger Delta in like Google News, you'll see all sorts of horrible, um, horrible things happening there. Kidnappings, robberies, explosions, coups. Um, and that's because uh, uh, something that's called a resource curse. Uh, the people don't benefit from any of the wealth of the oil resource there. Uh, it's uh, controlled by... Um, one or two tribes in particular in Nigeria itself has several hundred tribal groups. And so uh, the, um, uh, the, the people in charge uh, get all the wealth and the people that are actually living on the oil delta, uh, on the Niger Delta, don't, don't get anything. Uh, they live off of less than a dollar a day um, and uh, they uh, have to scrape by using various means. One of those means is so-called bunkering, where they uh, um, drill into oil pipes and, and get some of the oil to either sell it themselves or refine it themselves and then use it to power their cars. They even cook with that oil. Um, but that is obviously a very dangerous thing, drilling into a uh, oil pipeline. And so uh, tr horribly tragic uh, explosions happen uh, there. Um, uh, their, their land use laws are, are very different than ours. So ours in America, um, I own a teeny lot here in town. I think it's like 5,000 square feet, but I own everything from there all the way to the core, to the center of the planet. That's, that's mine, according to America and property rights. Um, in uh, Nigeria, you only land, own the very surface. You only at, own the land that your house is on, everything underneath it is uh, the government's to, to uh, um, extract. So yeah, this would make a really cool podcast if you want to um, talk about it. No, you don't own the air above your property. Uh, you get in big trouble. So like, yeah, you can't fly a drone more than like 400 feet or you start getting into federal airspace. And um, yeah, the, you don't own the air and you do not own the electromagnetic magnetic waves. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't mess around with the air. You will get in big trouble. Don't be sending missiles up from your house. Okay. Um, yeah, I won't belabor this anymore, but yeah. Uh, Nigeria is what's known as a kleptocratic regime. Regime uh, Klepto is Greek for stealing or thief or something. 
Um, and so again, yeah, the government has total property rights and is allowed to seize whatever they want to at any time. Um, uh, and what's also really bad, sad and terrible is most of this oil is being extracted by uh, oil nationals like Total and Shell. And um, so the, the oil wealth is being produced by uh, multinational corporations from England and France. And then they are, uh, uh, all the money goes to the government in Nigeria and all the oil goes to Europe and America. Um, and so, yeah, the people that actually, you know, have, you know, what we would think of as rights to the oil don't benefit whatsoever. And to avoid bunkering, the multinationals are now moving offshore and just producing the oil from, from far away from the ocean. Uh, horrible picture of a bunkering accident. Uh, yeah, we don't need to get, in, we don't need any more doom porn for today. Okay. Uh, let's talk briefly about air pollution and then we'll get on to the midterm. So uh, burning hydrocarbons is very messy. It produces something called volatile organic, organic compounds. Uh, burning hydrocarbons should just go straight to CO2, combine the carbon with oxygen and water, combine the hydrogen with oxygen. But incomplete combustion creates all sorts of uh, partially combusted products and volatile organic compounds like benzene, soot, all sorts of things where the combustion doesn't go all the way uh, to water and CO2. And so that creates things like smog. Uh, we can increase um, capture of smog and that sort of thing. And a lot of that has happened here in the United States with various uh, uh, clean air acts. Um, a lot of stuff came from Nixon, actually. He was one of the most environmentally uh, um, progressive uh, politicians that we've ever had, uh, despite him being Richard Nixon. Um, so this is what America looked like back in the uh, 70s, uh, but now this is what a lot of um, rapidly industrialized nations look like today. So if you go to uh, Bangladesh or uh, India or China, you'll see uh, air quality that looks a lot, a lot like this, or the Pacific Northwest in the summer. Yeah. Um, a really cool documentary on uh, Harbin, China, uh, produced by Vice. I'm not going to play Vice here on class, but you're welcome to to watch it on your own. Um, they actually do do some good journalistic work. They're just usually taking a lot of drugs while they're doing the the journalism. Uh, here is air emissions from fossil fuel resources. It's directly related to the carbon to hydrogen ratio in the fuel. So um, methane or natural gas is mainly hydrogen. And so a lot of its combustion products is water. And so it doesn't make a lot of CO2 per unit energy compared to oil, which is, you know, eight to, to um, 60 carbons surrounded by hydrogens. And then coal is just pure carbon. So that's going to make the most CO2 because you're just burning carbon. Um, so this is just a quick look. Don't need to memorize this. Just know that you get more CO2 when you're burning more, more carbon in, in respect of fuel and natural gas has the least amount of carbon. Coal has the most amount of carbon. Let me stop this share and then uh, change videos here to start with this. Okay. I'll do, I'll talk a bit more about coal and natural gas Friday, but for now, um, let's work on the midterm. Maybe I can show you a quick, quick, I'll show you some coal for fun. All right, so this is, this is some coal that I actually just harvested from the Seahome Arboretum right above campus. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of coal in that hill. This is anthracite, the densest coal, the most energy dense coal that uh, you can you can make. It's, so it's really, really old. Uh, that The older it gets, the more denser it gets, the more the hydrogen and water gets cooked off of it. Um, it's not the most optimum to burn because uh, it has uh, trace metals like vanadium and cesium and radioactive stuff and uh, sulfur. Uh, Powder River Basin coal is the, the cleanest coal, but that's a very loose term. Um, but it's surprisingly light. It's like, it feels like a third, third as heavy as it should for a rock this big. It's really light. And that's because it's not made out of iron and oxygen, like 
um, and aluminum and silicon, like a lot of rocks are, this is just carbon. So it feels really light. How did I harvest that? I walked up to where one of the old coal mines are and hit it with a hammer and chipped it off. I mean, I could throw it in my wood stove probably once it is hot enough and get some heat out of it. Um, but coal is just old peat. Peat is like the sod underneath your grass. It's uh, vegetation that doesn't uh, decompose because it's in anaerobic, anoxic uh, conditions. Um, so where glaciers have retreated, inland seas, swamps, they make a lot of peat. You bury the peat for millions of years and it turns into uh, to coal as everything gets cooked off. Um, and you can see that it's made out of old stuff. Do you guys see that little um, stick that's turned into coal there, right in the center? Yeah, so that used to be a tree branch and now it's, now it's coal. All right, questions about the midterm. I can keep talking. Am I right in thinking we're not allowed to discuss it outside of the class, like with each other? Yeah, I mean, it probably happened, but definitely not work on it together. Like, don't be sitting side by side writing, writing on your respective notes. That would be hard to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Um, should I wait till Friday when everybody's had much more time to look? Oh, wait, I'm seeing some stuff in the chat. What exactly do you mean by power draw in the first question? How much energy does the, this coal contain? It would have like twice as much for a chunk of wood this size. Um, what exactly do you mean by power draw in the first question? Is it over three hours of the laptop use or for a certain amount of time? And, and does the word discharge into the waste energy losses? Okay, yeah, let's look at that question. Um, okay, so here it is. You are feeling lazy and you binge watch Netflix for three hours lying in bed. Your laptop's power draw is 70 watts. So that means it's pulling 70 joules per second. A watt is a joule per second. So every second, 70 joules of energy goes from your house into your laptop. Or actually it's coming from a fully charged battery. So it's pulling from the battery. How much energy was discharged from the battery? So the battery is, is, is putting energy from itself into your laptop. That's what discharge means from the battery. And we have to know how much energy was discharged. Uh, please answer in kilowatt hours. Okay. Zoom controls pissing me off. No, go. Okay. All right. So here's your laptop. It's burning 70 watts. Um, and you watch Netflix for three hours. And what's, what's the main equation I want you all to know by the end of this class? Energy equals power times time. Yes, um, yeah. That's exactly right. You've already rearranged it for me. So normally I say power equals energy over time, but we can put time from the denominator up here. We can say that energy equals power times time. So you have to figure out which of these is time and which of these are power and do the math. And just remember that a kilo equals a thousand. So if you answer in kilowatt hours, you might have to do a little conversion because if you multiply these two together, you'll get watt hours. All right. So that was the first thing I saw in chat. Um, 
And does the word discharge include the waste energy lost or just the energy powering the laptop? Uh, it includes everything. Yeah, so that 70 watts goes into powering the laptop. Um, some of that goes into making uh, photons for your eyes and sound for your ears. And some of it just goes into making your laptop warm, uh, which gets to the second question, but you all should be able to figure that out on your own. Okay, 1.4. says the next day you and three friends hop in an old Subaru 26 miles per gallon to go hike Oyster Dome 10 miles from campus. How much energy is consumed round trip? Please assume unleaded gasoline fuel with an energy density of 46.4 megajoules per kilogram and answer in megajoules. Assume that gasoline has about the same specific density as water, such that one gallon weighs 3.79 kilograms. All right. So we got a Subaru. This is my version of a hatchback. And it gets 26 MPG. Um, what else do we know? It's you and three friends, that doesn't matter. Um, 26 miles per gallon is the next thing we know. Uh, Oyster Dome is 10 miles away, but it's round trip. So you go 10 miles there, 10 miles back. And that Gasoline is 46.4 megajoules per kilogram. And that a gallon uh, mass equals 3.79, is that what I said? Kilograms. So that's all we know. Let's start putting this together. Well, it takes energy to go somewhere. Uh, and we went 20 miles. To go those 20 miles, we have to burn gasoline. How much do we have to burn? Well, we know that we get 26 miles in a gallon. So 26 miles, that gives us a gallon. So the question is, how many gallons, X gallons, I'm just setting up a ratio and proportion for you math nerds. How many gallons do we have to burn to only go 20 miles? Well, we can rearrange this, right? So we have X gallons over gallons equals 20 miles over 26 miles. So X equals 20 over 26 gallons. That's how much fuel we had to move, burn. I think if that makes sense, right? Well, if I burn one gallon, I go 26 miles. If I go only 20 miles, I'm gonna burn less than a gallon because I don't need a whole gallon because I'm only going 20 miles. 20 divided by 26 is a number less than one. So it's less than one gallon. That makes intuitive sense. Okay, so that's how much fuel I need, but it's telling me the volume. It's telling me how many gallons, how many megajoules do I need? Well, that's where I use this energy density term and this specific density term. So the amount of energy is going to equal the energy density of the gas, 46.4 megajoules per kilogram. And then how many gallons I burn. So 20 over 26 
gallons, but damn it, I have kilograms and gallons. That's not making any sense. So I need to convert from gallons to kilograms. And that's what this mass density um, bit of information, that's where that's useful. And so I know that there's 3.79 kilograms per gallon. Let's look how that works. The gallons cancel out, the kilograms cancel out, and I'm left with megajoules. So that, that looks cool. All right. Um, next in chat, question one five. Would the change in temperature be negative? Do you want the answer in joules or kilowatt hours? Um, what did I say? So five, I said that night, the four of you each drink one liter of something frosty. So that'd be four liters total. Uh, to chill the four beverages, you place them in a the refrigerator. They are brought down from room temperature 22 to 2C. Assume that the heat capacity of the fluid is of the, that of water. How much energy is required to cool the beverages? Um, answer in megajoules or uh, kilowatt hours. Megajoules would be easier because the heat capacity of water is uh, 4.2 uh, kilojoules. Um, and then would it be negative? Well, it depends on perspective, right? Uh, it's negative to the beverages because energy was taken out of them, but it's, you still, somebody still had to pay for that energy and that refrigerator paid for the energy and that refrigerator is plugged into your house. So I'll accept a negative answer, but in general, whenever we're talking about energy, doing something for society, um, it's always in, in positive terms. Oh, yeah. I have another question about uh, that one. Yeah, go for it. So, the oh, hold on. My mind's blanking real quick. Uh, so, the heat capacity of water, right? Do you want us to use the exact or like the 4.4200 one? I, either. I mean, the, the answer is going to be the same. All right. I got you. Thank you. Yeah, you can use 4,184.16 or whatever the hell, or you can just do 4,200. It's going to be the same same answer. So Alrighty. Like, did you walk 287 steps to the store or 300? Felt the same. Um, should we use sig figs or round to the specific decimal? Uh, yes. Um, I'm not. I'm not a huge stickler for sig figs, but I definitely prefer. Uh, pretty easy to look at numbers rather than big, big piles of garbage that came out of your calculator. Okay. Um, one six, do we have to fully write out the equations you're using before you input the numbers? Um, no, you can just put it all in one one big line with the numbers itself, um, kind of like I, I did. I have the numbers and the units all all in the same line. Uh, just uh, enough that I can tell what you did. If you just put the answer, then I'm gonna assume you cheated. And if you um, if you just have like random numbers without units, then I won't be able to follow it as well. And it's more difficult for me to give you partial credit. If you use things like units, then I can at least follow your thinking. So even if the answer is totally wrong, I'll be like, well, they had it right up until this point. So they should still get like four out of five points. Whereas if it's just raw numbers, no units, then I don't, I don't really know what, what was going on. Okay, one, six. This one's about flying to Maui. Um, so it's 2,760 miles away. You go back and forth. So it's going to be something like uh, 54, 55, uh, 100 miles. And then uh, note the average energy consumption for passenger aircraft is 1.853 megajoules per passenger kilometer. So yes, you and your four friends are on this airplane, but you're not responsible for all the energy required for it to go to Hawaii. You're responsible for just a portion of it because there's uh, 200 and some odd other passengers that are burning that fuel too on their way to Hawaii. 
And so that's why we use things like passenger kilometers, because we're just talking about the energy for you and your friends, not everybody else. So how much energy is consumed flying round trip for you and your three friends? Please answer in gigajoules. Okay, um, so. You're in an airplane, you're going to Hawaii, and it is um, 2760 miles away, but you go there and back. So this can be 2x this. Now this 1.83, 1.853, one point eight five three megajoules per passenger kilometer. This is an interesting unit. So it's energy per distance. Um, it's almost like a power because power is energy over time. This is energy over distance. And so to get the total energy, instead of taking power times time, I take this energy per distance time distance. So it'd be total energy is going to be 1.853 megajoules per passenger kilometer times the total amount of kilometers times the number of passengers, right? Because P needs to cancel and kilometers need to cancel. Now I have energy equally, equaling an energy unit. How many passengers? Well, we're not talking about the whole plane. We're just talking about four of you and you need some distance, which is this right here, going back and forth. Does that make sense? So figure that out for the four of you, and then try to think about what would happen if the entire world got to go to Hawaii once a year. It's all 7.8 billion of us. And then I want you to compare that answer to global energy use, which is 500 exajoules. And you'll realize that um, people that are fortunate enough to be able to travel like that, travel internationally for all intents and purposes, because it's kind of similar to going to Paris or something, um, you know, they use the majority of the energy allocated to society. Uh, and so you should in number 1.7, when you calculate what happens when all 7.8 billion people do it, it should be something, you know, near like, a, you know, factor of 10x or a factor of 100x less or greater than total societal energy use. And you'll realize that, um, yeah, that people that are able to, to fly like that are, are quite privileged and, and use a lot, a lot more energy than the average human being on the planet. Yeah, 1.7 essentially the same problem, but with a different number of passengers. Exactly. Yeah. Probably not too smart for the whole world to go to Hawaii right now. No, they would not be happy about it. Um, yeah, if you go to Hawaii right now, you get, you get the privilege of paying for a 14-day uh, hotel stay before you can even leave your hotel because you need to be quarantined. Yeah, the number of friends definitely matters on the passenger for terms of passenger kilometers, but not for the Subaru. Um, yeah, if you loaded like 10 people into your Subaru, it's not going to get 26 miles per gallon anymore. But um, just the four people, it's not going to change things too much. Uh, the driving habits of the driver would change things much more than, than having one or four people. If it's a WRX and the person's flooring it to every stoplight, then it's gonna get terrible mileage. Not to clown on WRXs, I'm just jealous if you have one. All right, um, 1.7, 1 1.3, 2.2. Okay, let's head over to 2.2. So share screen. 
back to the PDF. Okay, so this is Mauritania's energy use. Um, if any of you watched that film yet? I love that movie. Makes I did. Me, makes me which, wanna... which, which one? Um, the, the, it's like a, a film about the massive uh, rail line that goes from um, Nakchuk, I forget the name of the- Yeah. Place. Yeah, on the coast. that was that was beautifully shot. I mean, so incredibly beautifully shot. Yeah, the, he did. He took this special, like super wide angle, high aperture, low aperture Nikon lens, and like, and built his own rig to put it on a Sony camera. Yes, super super nerdy, but super awesome. And it's just like really tastefully done. Like, there's no no judgment or anything. It was definitely the you know the the show don't tell style of storytelling, which I greatly prefer. Anyways, enough of, enough of geeking out on films. Um, so using the most recent information available at the CIA and EIA websites, complete the first five lines of the table below for Mauritania. Note that recent data may come from different years. So yeah, we even though we're in the information age, information is, is not there for all places at all times, not even for America. That's why we're still doing, you know, censuses, censuses all the time. And we can't even figure out how to vote. And we're supposed to be like a beacon of democracy, whatever. Let's not talk about politics. Um, make sure that you read primary energy and express your results in joules, express carbon emissions in million metric tons. Okay. It should be a megaton. All right, so I, on the website, I, um, on the Canvas page, I now put much more straightforward links to these websites. Before it was hidden in an announcement. Apologies for that. I had them all in homework three, but then I decided not to do homework three because it's too close to the midterm. So scrolling down to the take home midterm module, I now have both those websites here. And so if we go to something like uh, EIA World Energy Data, you can open that tab. And here is the globe. So we can go to Mauritania right here, click it. And um, 2017 primary energy data, total energy consumption is right here, 0.039 quadrillion BTUs. So you have to recall that it's not a beer, it's just LaCroix. You have to recall that um, BTU equals 1,055 joules because it's an English unit, so it makes no sense. Um, and then uh, a quadrillion equals 10 to the 15. So one with 15 zeros. So a quadrillion BTU equals 1.055 exajoules. Exa equals 10 to the 18. Sorry, my pen ran out of room there. So this is 10 to the three, 10 to the three times 10 to the 15 equals 10 to the 18. So that's a quad. And so there it is uh, for that. Um, other information can be found elsewhere. Some of the lines that I even have you calculate like energy per capita is already done down here. But again, it's in these janky BTU units. Is that way too small for you guys? Oh my God, what did I just do? I changed the annotation. Um, it looks yeah. fine. Um, so yeah, here's population, people in thousands, so 4.5 million people. So you can start figuring out some of those things. Um, GDP, per GDP, so that's kind of already calculated, but again, you have to do some unit conversions there. Just be really careful with your powers of 10. We're throwing around terms like mega, kilo, uh, thou people in thousands. There's all sorts of janky 
like uh, powers of 10 being thrown about here. So you just write things down as you see them to, to keep, keep track of what's going on. Um, what else do we need? CO2 production. Um, let's click data. Other statistics, total energy. I mean, this is this is your all job. You gotta you gotta figure this out. I'm I'm paid too much to actually do dirty work now. That's a joke. I still do dirty work and I don't get paid enough. Um, CIA World Factbook. Let's check that out. Let's clear these annotations. So select country to view, go down to Mauritania. This should be alphabetical order. Um, CIA World Factbook has a lot more energy, but a lot more, I mean, a lot more information. Information is energy, uh, but we, uh, a lot of stuff is not as useful for this class, except for the, the paragraph later on where you try to, you know, prognosticate and think about what's going to happen in the next 10 years. Um, but so energy was right here. And I think we have a mission somewhere down here. Petroleum, natural gas, natural gas. Yeah, carbon dioxide emissions from consumption of energy, 2017 estimate, um, 2.65, 2.615 million metric tons. Here in this, there's no way you can, there's no way to know what they mean by M. You just have to use intuition. Um, so it's not going to be million, million tons. That'd be crazy amounts that that'd be teratons of carbon, which would destroy the planet in like one year. So this is going to be, this M stands for metric tons, but um, you just have to, again, yeah, use your intuition when you start seeing some of these numbers. Uh, anything beyond a gigaton would be way too much carbon. So if you're, if you're getting an answer beyond a gigaton, then, then this probably means metric tons, not megatons. So here's that there. And um, yeah, if you want to start looking at some things that may be changing its future, this is where um, you can see different geopolitical uh, strife, child labor problems, um, uh, economy, government, people in society will help help you think about what's happening uh, uh, there. Population dynamics. So yeah, you can you can really dig into this for any country and think about how energy relates to um, quality of life and uh, you know future economic growth or lack thereof. What have I been missing in the chat? There's been 12 new chats. MT, same as megaton. Not sure. Again, you have to use your intuition on that. Just a million million would be a tera, 10 to the 12, because a million is 10 to the 6. So 10 to the 6 times 10 to the 6 would be 10 to the 12, which would be way too much carbon. So if you have a million M tons, then M stands for metric. Um, 1.5, do we know, need to know the COP of the refrigeration? Uh, no, we're just talking about the energy going into the, um, that's a really good question. That would be, yeah, if you take like uh, energy 460, like building energy, then we do stuff like that. But yeah, that's that's too smart for energy 101. Good on you. Um, just the amount of energy going into the fuel. Okay, what flavor of LaCroix? orange right now pretty boring key lime all the way key lime tastes like cotton candy it's pretty crazy nobody likes coconut my mom does and i think she's a communist yeah <laughs> she probably is <laughs> all right um let's see 2.3 as well okay let me check that out all right, we're at 250. I'm going to keep on going for 10 more minutes. What screen am I sharing now? 
Whenever I stop sharing screen, Zoom decides to put its like control panel on one of my three monitors and it's random every time. Drives me crazy. Okay, so here's 2.3. Compete the last five lines of table finding, if you're clever, the appropriate metrics or... So yeah, these last five lines, you can sometimes find these values. You'll often have to do unit conversions from things like quadrillion BTUs to exajoules, for example. Um, but I try to put the, uh, the units here and at least these first three. So you have to do a little math if you don't find the raw thing. So energy use per capita, that would be, you take the total energy use of Mauritania and divide it by the total amount of people. And that would give the per annum or per year energy use per capita, GDP per capita, same thing. You take the amount of money made in a year, GDP, and divide it by the number of people or just find GDP per capita. Energy intensity is an interesting one. So this, this basically says how much money does, how much energy does it take to make a dollar? And uh, there's that cool chart I showed a while back showing like, you know, wealth of nations versus energy use of nations and different places like Ireland, for example, it doesn't take a lot of energy to make money because they work in a lot of uh, financial businesses. Information technology is another one, uh, but raw resource extraction societies like uh, Russia or Mauritania, it takes more energy to, to make a buck, mining coal and iron and, and fishing and that sort of thing. And so this is a just an interesting marker on economic development for different countries. So you can look at you take the total energy per year and divide it by uh, the total GDP. And that gives you the energy intensity, uh, the economic energy intensity. CO2 per capita, total CO2 uh, that you got from that CIA website divided by the total number of people. And then CO2 per GDP, total number of CO2 divided by GDP. So these are all really good like techno-economic metrics. So um, combining uh, economies, and energy science to say something about the um, development or lack thereof of different nation states. And it helps you, helps policymakers think about how to improve quality of life uh, in, in different places. Can we find some of these equations in the useful equations PDF? No, unfortunately not. Um, but the equations, yeah, let me put this on this side of the screen. Can I write on this? I like text, sign document, tools, fill and sign. Doesn't look like I can write straight on this. Maybe I can with um, Zoom. Now where's my stuff? Annotate, draw. Okay, so. That sucks. Am I even sharing the right screen? What am I even sharing anymore? Zoom turns you into like a baby boomer. You like can't even use technology anymore. You're still sharing the second part of the midterm homework. Okay, good. I'm trying to draw on it. Your now. video is on your page in front of you. My video is on my page in front of me. We have a split screen. Oh, can you see my um, my camera showing in my graph paper? Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay, I'll draw on that. So, yeah, energy use. I'll just go through the second half of the table. I'm not going to write everything because it'll take too much time. So this is the second, the last five lines. So energy use per capita would be total energy consumption, which should be something you already filled out on the, on the upper five lines, primary energy use in joules, divided by total population. So this will be something like we were in kind of in exigual land population was in the millions. So 10 to 18 by 10 to six, this should be like uh, probably gigajoules per person or something like that. Okay. 
if you don't quite get that, then blame it on me because I'm not actually putting in the numbers. Uh, GDP per capita, this would be total GDP divided by total population. So this would be dollars per person. Um, for reference, United States is like $55,000 per person. So this should be quite a bit lower than that. If you get a, if you get way lower than that, if you get less than like a cent per person, that doesn't make sense. You did the math wrong. You get something bigger than $55,000 per person, that doesn't make sense. You did the math wrong. So all this stuff, I mean, your entire life, just use your intuition for when you're working with numbers, especially if you're like watching the news. If somebody says something stupid on the news, like just think about it for a second, and try to decide if it's correct or not. Um, critical thinking skills. Energy intensity is three, line three. So energy intensity would be um, total GDP divided by total energy consumption. And this will give you dollars per joule. And I don't have a good frame of reference for that. I'm sorry. I'll have to, maybe I'll get one by Friday. Four is CO2 per capita. So this is total CO2 per year. Get this from the CIA divided by total population. So this tells you how much CO2 in that nation is produced per person which is likely uh, a misnomer or slightly disingenuous, right? Because where do you think all that iron is going? Is it going to Mauritania or might it be going to Europe? Probably going to Europe. Uh, you know, it reminds me of how people complain about, um, you know, China's CO2 emissions are going up, have gone up so much year after year in the last 20 years. But where does your Apple iPhone come from, dude? Like you, you are emitting that CO2 by walking around with your Apple iPhone, not, not some, somebody in rural China. Um, finally, CO2 production per GDP, same kind of equation, total CO2 per year divided by uh, GDP. So this is interesting because it basically tells you the price of carbon. Um, tells you uh, for every ton, metric ton of carbon, how much money do you get? And this is something policymakers are very interested in because how do we price carbon? It's an externality right now. It's a, it's a bad thing that's, that we get to emit for free. Should it have a price and what should that price be? Uh, people often say like about $100 per ton seems to be appropriate. Um, and that would really motivate shifts from fossil fuels to renewables, for example. Okay, what's going on in the chat now? Okay. Show our work for unit conversions for 2.2. Um, no, you don't have to show your work for unit conversions, but if you get the wrong answer and you just have the answer, I won't know where you got it from and you'll get it all wrong. Whereas if you show your unit conversions, I'll be like, okay, it was right up until this point, you should get half credit or, you know, two thirds credit or almost all credit just because there's a little math slip that we all make. Um, my question got skipped over. Do you mind talking about 1.3? So 1.3 was about efficiency for the laptop. And I will stop share to try to make my uh, video bigger. So 1.3 says, given your answer from 1.1, recall 1.1 was how much energy did the laptop uh, consume from its battery? So let's just say E laptop for that energy. 
Um, given your answer from 1.1 and assuming your laptop's battery is 90% efficient, how much energy is required to recharge your laptop? Okay, so the laptop's battery dumped into the laptop so you can watch uh, Netflix. But now you have to plug your battery into the wall. And it's going to pull energy out of your wall. And it's going to pull more energy than went into your laptop or less? Uh, more. More, absolutely. Second law of thermodynamics. Anytime energy is converted, some energy is lost. So we have pure electricity coming out of that wall. It turns into chemistry in your battery and then turns back into electricity and goes into your laptop. This process is 90% efficient. So eta, eta equals 90% or efficiency is 90%. Now efficiency equals what you get over what you pay. What you got was the energy put into your laptop while you watch Netflix. What you pay is what came out of the wall. And so 0 0.9 equals your answer from 1.1 divided by pay, this is what we're solving for. So pay equals E laptop over 0 0.9. We have a number less than one in the denominator, which makes this grow. Uh, we can see that explicitly if we write that as a fraction. So laptop nine over 10, that's what 0 0.9 is, it's nine tenths, equals E laptop getting sloppy, uh, times 10 divided by nine. All right, we'll talk more uh, Friday. Thank you, Charles. Thank yeah. you. Adios. Thanks. Thanks, have a good weekend. Bye. Hey, come back Friday. Don't just run away. Bye. <laughs>